So welcome everybody. Good that you uh, took the long road uh, to this room. Uh, we, we provided you with some food, so we, uh, you needed maybe that for, uh, for the way back. And um, so it's good to, to have you here. Um, people today, or yesterday, or the day before, asked me actually two questions, and that was not the question about uh, Red Hat, of course. But it was about why are you wearing these Red Hat t-shirts? So what's the so what's the Red Bull T-shirts about? So, so, what is, so if you look at Formula One, it's really an innovative sport. So it's all about being the first one on the finish line. It's all about reliability. So there are a lot of analogies that you can use for IT. And of course, we are very proud because we have a very good Dutch driver, that's Max Verstappen, and we are a Dutch company, so we're also a little bit proud on that. So that's why we use this Red Bull uh, T-shirts. So the, the second question is, is, so where can I get those very nice stroke waffles that I got? So if you want to have a second one, you can get it on our boots. It's on A29, so you can, can, uh, can get it over there. So let's quickly introduce myself. So my name is Eric Kessels. I'm working for Fairbanks, a company in the Netherlands, and we are doing professional services all around OpenStack. On this side is Matthijs van Velo. He is the senior OpenStack consultant in our organization. So he knows a lot of stuff about what about OpenStack, how to use it, how to implement it, all everything around OpenStack. That's what he knows. And if you look at our roadmap, we are all started in 2011 with OpenStack. And that's was the early days. I think when we started, the OpenStack Foundation wasn't even there. So when I had my first training in Rackspace, there were only three projects for OpenStack. So that was Nova Compute, Nova Network, and it was Swift. So it was very, it was a pretty easy training. But if you look at now how many projects there are, it's huge. And and I, when I'm talking to people during the, the exhibition. A lot of people find it difficult to, to see what kind of project do I need, what kind of functionality do I need, where do, you, do I need to look at. And even I, working for OpenStack for already six years, it's not easy to, to see what kind of stuff you need for OpenStack. But we went that route, and now we are here, and I think all our businesses within, uh, on our organization is fully switched to OpenStack. So originally we were a VMware shop, and now we are an organization that's fully oriented around, uh, around OpenStack, and I think we are very proud in, uh, in achieving that. So what I want to talk about today is about what do we see trends of our OpenStack customers? What do we see? What do, do they ask? What is going on with them? So what they are asking is fast, faster adoption is required, because when you implement OpenStack, and you want to go to use it, the time that you put your workloads in OpenStack needs to be short when the environment's ready and up and running. So what we see is that organizations take a long time before they put weight on their OpenStack environment because they think it's complex. They think, how do the hell can I leverage the OpenStack platform? So faster adoption is really required for that. And how do you do that? Put workloads on the OpenStack environment very quickly so that the OpenStack environments get weight in your organizations. It always co also convinced your internal organization. It always convinced your IT teams that OpenStack is a super good platform in running workloads on top of. So make sure that the workloads go fast into OpenStack. Another trend that we see is that there are a lot of organizations started with OpenStack. They put workloads on it. In the beginning, it was maybe a test machine. And slowly, it gets to acceptance tests. And then finally, somebody said, hey, where is my machine? Oh, it was a production machine. So what happens with that? So people are started with OpenStack. They build it. They extend the environment. And at some stage, customers ask for knowledge. They ask for SLAs on the OpenStack environment. And that's, that request we get often. So can you help us with getting the platform into the next level, getting it get OpenStack in a size and make it um, maintainable also for the IT organization itself? And that's what we provide. So we help them with the make them, making the right steps. 
to make sure that they meet the SLAs that customers that are using the OpenStack platform are uh, being met. And the third one is the need for developer infrastructure. So developers want to start with developing uh, code, of course. That's why they, they, they are there. And ideas come very quickly. And so if you have an idea and you want to build your uh, developers, uh, so you, will, you build your application, then you really need to speed up in building that infrastructure for those developers to, to get them going. And you want to do it in a structured way. So, and, uh, so that's really important when you want to speed up, because that's all about Formula One, the one who is innovative, the one who is the fastest, will be the first that reach the finish line. And those topics, we will uh, show you that in a, in a demonstration. So how can you address these topics? And so we prepared two demonstrations. So one demo is all about uh, migration. So how do I get my workloads on OpenStack? And the second demonstration is how can I, can I build the developer infrastructure for your developers? So one thing, so I will start with, uh, with smooth workload migration. So what is the challenges about that? So what you don't want is that you, if you want to put weight on your OpenStack environment, you don't want to do everything manually. You want to automate the process for moving workloads into OpenStack. And that's a, that's a process that you want to automate. But, so as you know, because when you are having a workload running in VMware and you want to move it into OpenStack, during the migration process, you need, to change, you need to change the drivers. You need to put software in that VM that can run an OpenStack. And if you do that all manually, that takes you a lot of time, especially when you have, a, for example, five, 600 VMs running on VMware, you want to move it to OpenStack, so then you want to automate that process. And there is software for it that you can use to speed up the process in that. So for, for this process, we use uh, Haystacks. That's a software partner from us that, uh, that provides a software that runs on, uh, on OpenStack. And what I would like to show you is how is that tied into OpenStack? So how does it look like when you run it in OpenStack? So that's one point. So, and how do you set up the migration? So how do you make sure that the workloads start replicating between, for example, the VMware op uh, environment into OpenStack? But it also could be an OpenStack to OpenStack, because we still see customers using Liberty, for example, as their OpenStack platform, and they want to move to the latest version. It's really difficult to, to upgrade those platforms. So, so you need to have a way to lift and shift that workload from the older OpenStack platform into the new one. So the migration, you can use it in different ways. And so how, has been, how, how does that work? So if you look at the architecture picture in this case, you see on the, on the right-hand side, you see the source environment. So in this case, it could be a VMware environment, it could be an OpenStack environment, it could be, an, uh, it could be Azure, it could be Amazon. So it really doesn't matter where the workload is coming from. And the process is controlled by the Haystack Accur. That's an appliance that you run inside of OpenStack and it consists actually of two parts. So the top three green parts, that's the appliance that controls the migration and the replication process. So that's the controller that's linked into OpenStack, it's linked to the Keystone, it's linked to the OpenStack service that it will use to do the migration stuff. And the bottom part, the fourth one, that's an additional machine that runs in OpenStack, and that actually does the replication. Because you can imagine when you have for example, 400 VMs, you don't want to have, the, have one machine doing the replication process into OpenStack. You want to scale up in that. So that's why there is an additional machine that does the replication, because you want to scale up when you have a lot of workloads running and you want to move them in OpenStack. So on the, on the, right, on the, on the right hand side, that's the target cloud. In our demonstration, that's OpenStack. And there will the the migration will, process will move too. So, so actually what happens when, when you set up a migration, the data first is being replicated to the target environment. So the first step that you do is set up the replication so the data 
lands on the OpenStack platform. And when that's done and the data is in sync, then you are ready to do the migration itself. So actually there are two basic steps in that whole migration process. And if you think about this, another interesting use case is also using it for disaster recovery. So in this demonstration, I focus on migrating workloads. But in the same idea, you could use this also for disaster recovery purposes, because you replicate data from one platform into OpenStack, and you can run that workloads also within OpenStack. So you could also think about a disaster, disaster recovery mo model for using that. So let's see how it looks like. So let me first log into the environment. So I do the demonstration into the sandbox environment that we have uh, uh, at our, uh, in, within our organization. And if you want to test it, please feel free to contact us because the sandbox is publicly available. So if you want to run some migration test or you want to, to test the developer infrastructure, yeah, please come by at the boot. We are at A29, so you can request for access to the environment and maybe play with it. So, so within OpenStack, I have a tenant where the Haystacks Acura appliance is running. So as you see here, I have one Haystacks VM, so that's the appliance that's controlling the migration process. And I have my Fabings Cloud agent, so that's the VM that does actually the data replication. So here is the, 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 the Haystacks appliance, so I can log in with my credentials and I can have access to the appliance, and this is the appliance where you control the migration process with. So as you see, I've mentioned, the, I clicked on Fabing, so that's a customer uh, within the Haystacks uh, Acura appliance. So you can have multiple customers configured within, within the Haystacks, uh, Haystacks appliance, because I can imagine when you have one customer you want to run the workload migration into, another customer will maybe have other requirements to do the migration. So that in that way, you can have one appliance and doing multiple customers' uh, uh, workload migrations. So the first step that I need to do is to set up the replication between my Haystacks appliance and between the VM that I want to migrate. The steps that I'm doing now, I just want to show you how the steps are. So the steps are all also possible to automate, but just to give you an idea of what's happening and what the steps are doing underneath. But of course, the process is also, uh, uh, you, can also pros uh, you can also automate the process, of course. So when I'm doing the replication, I first prepare my agent. So what happens is that I prepare an agent, and the agent, I install it on the VM that I want to migrate. So that's my first step that I'm going to do. So in this case, I can select what, I, what do I want. So in this case, you see three options. So one is the vSphere option. So what happens there is that you don't put the agent inside of the workload, but you put the agent inside of the hypervisor within VMware. So then you can speed up the migration process. Instead of migrating one by one, you migrate a one hypervisor within VMware in one go. So that's why you have the vSphere integration to, to make the process for migration work workloads even easier. So the second two are very obvious. So I have Windows workloads and I have Linux workloads. So that's something what you can uh, choose of. And those are the agents that, are, that you install on the VMs. So I selected uh, Linux and then I select uh, the group where I want to uh, use the agent for. And then I can download it. So it will download a uh, RPN uh, package in this case. So one thing I would like to show you is that uh, in this case you can also select which Linux flavor you want. So I can also select the sender with one. And then say download agent. 
So what happens then is it will download an RPM package on my laptop in this case, and that's the package that I can use to put on the VM that I want. So the process is running. So what I do is just, I just, just to show you, I use uh, FileZilla, so I can migrate or move the agent. I can copy it on the VM that I want to migrate to. Just wait, it's copying and over. So what I'm not, if, if the agent is there, I can install the agent on the machine. So let's flip to the machine and reconnect it. So there's my agent, so I'll put it on the, on the machine. So now I can install it, it's, it's super duper easy. So what happens now, it installs the agent. So what you see in the installation process, I do not specify anything about the IP address of my appliance or anything configuration metrics I don't specify because I prepared that when I designed the agent. So the agent is running now, and now the agent automatically connects to the Haystacks Acura appliance to say, hey, I'm ready to, to go. So if I'm flipping back uh, to, the, to the Haystacks appliance, I see that there are two machines in a discovered state. So now the machine is discovered, so the agent has connected to the Astex appliance and saying, hey, I'm ready, so tell me what to do. So the first step, what you are going to do then, is do the migration, uh, do the replication. So that's the first step that uh, you are going to do. So I start my replication, and now the, the, the replication process is going to start. So what happens now in OpenStack, because that's, the, of course, the, the stuff that, uh, that's happening on the background, is when you look at the volumes in your Haystacks appliance, it will create a volume in OpenStack. And this volume will be used to replicate the data through the VM that's running in the Haystacks uh, tenant. And when the replication is finished, then the volume is ready to use for the migration process. So then you can make it into the next step and saying, okay, data is replicated, also based on the speed of the connection between the infrastructures, of course. And then you can say, okay, now I'm ready to go and now I need to set up my migration. So what you can do with the migration is also setting up a application group. So in my demonstration, it's super easy because I just do one I just do one VM, but of course, when you want to migrate an application, maybe you have 10 or 15 VMs that are combined as the application. So within the uh, migration tool, you can set up a migration plan. So the plan is actually saying, okay, now I'm going to do the migration, and this is the steps that I'm going to do. So let's see how that looks like. You see that, uh, that the, the VM is migrating, so it's, yeah, the, 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 it's going through the internet connection, so it's not super fast, but I already prepared, of course, uh, a VM that's already been replicated. So what you can do for making the migration process easy, there is a migration plan. So the migration plan can, for example, say my IP range is X, and when I'm doing the migration, the IP range is going to change. It also can be the same, because I can imagine when you have more like a legacy application that you don't want to change the IP addresses. And the cool thing about OpenStack is that you can run that application with exactly the same IP configuration within your tenant, because that's a, a closed network. So you can fairly easily put your application in the tenant. You can test it, you can see if it's working. Maybe you do the replication another time, you do it three times. And when you are feeling well and then think, okay, now it's ready to go, then you can, can do the actual migration. And the good thing is that you can run the application within the tenant. So you can, you can prevent that maybe this migration will come on to the network and saying, hey, I have the same application on the other side, what do I need to do? So you can isolate the testing of the application on OpenStack too. So let's go back.
So the migration plan in this case is only one machine. So I can easily add additional machines to the migration plan because it's an application. I can uh, add it. So I have a fairly easy uh, graphical interface to set up the migration plan. So, so that's fairly easy. So let's see what happens when I'm doing that. So what happens when I'm doing the migration, just to explain it, is when the migration plans actually happens, it will create a network in OpenStack, it will create a router in OpenStack, it will create a virtual machine in OpenStack to make sure that the, that the machine is hooked up to the volume that it's going to use. So all those steps are automated from one uh, single point, and that's from the Acura Hastex uh, appliance. So let's do the replication itself. So let's see what happens. So I run the replication. So I can start, sorry, I run the migration. I click on that. And then I run the migration. So let's go through it. I select the plan, so that's the demo plan I've prepared. Let's give it a name. So I call it It's saying, it's, it's showing you the machines that are inside of my uh, migration plan. And then I say run migration. So now the migration starts and now it creates an open stack. It will create the, the machine that you want to migrate. So let's see what happens there. So first of all, it needs to prepare the, the volume. So let's see if that's happening. So I go to volume. So that's the first step it needs to do because it doesn't use the volume that's doing the replication because that will, of course, that will impact the volume that's doing the replication itself. So you want to have a new volume that you are going to use for your application. So it takes a while because the the internet connection is not super fast. So in that way, you can fairly easily do the migration uh, into OpenStack. So that's the way in really automating the process. I will show you the screen later on because it takes a while because the VM is, uh, has been building up. And uh, in that way, you can fairly easily migrate workloads in, in, into OpenStack and put weight on that OpenStack environment because if you take too long to put really weight in your OpenStack environment, people also lose their attention within the organization. Or managers think, hey, it takes too long. So in this case, you can very, very easily do the migration into OpenStack and speed up the process in using that, uh, that environment. So in the, within, the, within Haystacks, you also have the event view, viewer, of course. So then you can see all the events uh, stuff is going to happen. You see that on the top, the migration process has started, so it's, it's running on the background now, and now it's preparing the VM to, to be prepared. So, so this is uh, the demo for the uh, Haystacks appliance. So uh, when I'm finishing or we're finishing the demonstration, you can ask questions, so I would like to move forward with the next demo, and then after that, you can ask uh, questions about, uh, about the migration process. And Nick is here from Haystack, so if you want to ask him questions, he is available for also for answering that, because he is the founder of the organization and he built the, the application with his team. Okay, so let's move to the next, uh, to the next demo. To flip it over, so, so the next demo is all about uh, developer infrastructure. So if you want your developers start working, so so what do you need? So one one thing is that you need a, a desktop or you need a laptop that they can use for running their developer tools. And of course, a lot of developers ask for a Kubernetes cluster or something like that to build their applications. So we as Fairbanks, we focus on the infrastructure layer. So we're not focusing all on the tooling that you put on top of Kubernetes or that kind of stuff is not where we all, where we're not experienced in, and that's not our goal. So we provide the infrastructure for the for the developers. So we are on the the bottom level of it. So one thing is from how does it infrastructure look like? Because all the advantage of OpenStack, it would be great if you could also use that 
that advantages to, for example, to put in desktops for developers in OpenStack because you can access this from any place where you are. You can you have influence on the performance that you want to give to the desktops. Do you want to have fast desktop? Do you want desktop with a lot of data? So running those desktops in OpenStack can really can really help in uh, de defining the right desktop uh, layout that the desk that the that the developer needs to use. And another thing is when you want to because when the developer is going to start and they want to, for example, use Kubernetes, it would be very cool if you could just deploy a Kubernetes in one go and not thinking too much about how the Kubernetes cluster needs to be confer, uh, configured, all the steps that you need, need to do to make the Kubernetes cluster running. So make those steps easier will speed up the process for the developers to, to get going with their work. So, but that's the goal, of course, because you don't want to wait for four months before they can start uh, programming. So, and uh, the, the, the infrastructure helps you to speed up the process. So for the Kubernetes installation, we use uh, Juju because we are a partner from Canonical and we use Juju and Mass already for five years because it also is a super cool to deploy OpenStack with. But that's not the talk for today, but our experience in using Mass and Juju to, to deploy OpenStack environments uh, is also very useful when you want to deploy a Kubernetes cluster because that's, it's also an infrastructure that you want to deploy in one go. So we use Juju for that, and Juju, actually Juju is actually looking like a little bit the same as the Haystack appliance because you run a Juju controller inside of your tenant, so that's a machine that controls the deployment process. And when you trigger the process, then you can say, okay, let's deploy a Kubernetes cluster. And because of the, that the Juju controller is running inside the tenant, it will deploy the Kubernetes cluster in the tenant where the controller is sitting in. <clears throat> because the controller, of course, is tied into OpenStack. It, it's attached to the, uh, to the APIs. So that's why the, the Juju controller is, that's, that's the way how you can use that because it's sitting inside of, um, it's inside of the tenant. So how is it going to look? Uh, how does that look? Just to make sure that the screen is refreshed. So this is my Juju controller sitting in OpenStack. Um, it's a graphical interface, and I only show you that because then I can show you a bit how it works. Uh, I think we together never use it because we always use the command line. That's typical how Linux, <laughs> Linux engineers will act. But that's more a way in showing how you can use Juju how to deploy a Kubernetes cluster. So what you do, you build your controller, and on the controller you log in to a model. So the nice thing about using a controller in combination with a model is that you can have one model that's doing the Kubernetes installation, but you can also have a, a second model that will install another type of application. And what we also can use is, we use for running the developer desktop infrastructure, what Matthijs is gonna talk about, we also deploy that with Juju. So to build the desktop infrastructure for the developers, we use Juju to install that infrastructure in the OpenStack environment. So let's do that. So one way in doing it, I can just uh, select plus, so I I come in to the star, to, to, into the charm store where all the, the configurations are that I want to deploy with Juju. And, and here you see there are different flavors in installing a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, people who maybe know Canonical and know their Kubernetes distribution, they will recognize these. And what you can do is just select the flavor that you want. So, so let's select, I will select the Kubernetes core and I will add it to the model. So what happens here is that it will add the model to my controller. So that's step one. So now it's saying, okay, I want to build my um, Kubernetes cluster and now I'm gonna ready to deploy it. The, the bundle that you use is configured and saying, if I want to have the Kubernetes cluster, how many workers do I get? How many 
uh, how is my flannel uh, network is being built up. So all that configuration work is done within the bundle that you employ, deploy. So now I can deploy it and I commit and then the Kubernetes cluster will be deployed within the tenant where the controller is running. I didn't commit it, so I can just refresh it. And then the configuration is gone because I just want to show you how you can deploy the, the, the desktop infrastructure. So we use Leo Stream for that. So that's a VDI solution that runs in OpenStack. In our use case, we show you how you can uh, uh, deploy Linux desktops in OpenStack, but you also can use it as a VDI solution for Windows desktop or whatever desktop you want with different kind of protocols. Um, but the cool thing, it is really nicely integrated into OpenStack. So let's find it out. So in this case, you see that there are two components. So one is the, the broker and one is the gateway. So I just let me select the, the broker and I add it to the model. Then I say deploy. And then when I actually do deploy, it will install the Leo Stream broker within the tenant that I've configured. was in the wrong model, so I need to redo it. So now it's running. Okay, so now I've deployed it. I selected the model that was already there, so it creates a new model to put the application inside. So now my Leo Stream broker is deployed, so now yeah, I just need to wait before my VM is ready in OpenStack to, to use the, the Leo Stream broker. Um, but we already prepared that for, uh, for you, so we're not gonna wait before the Leo Stream broker is, uh, has been deployed, so we're gonna uh, flip over to the Leo Stream demonstration. We would like to give you the word to Matthijs, and he's going to take you through the, the Leo Stream, uh, to, to the, into the Leo Stream demonstration. Hello, Matthijs Velu, working for uh, almost four years now for Fairbanks. Um, I will try and show you how, uh, uh, how the instances for Leo Stream, for Leo Stream work. Um, so, what Eric just uh, did was uh, uh, deploying uh, the uh, the instance, uh, the, 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 the charm, and we already have those uh, those items over here. Um, and uh, layer stream gateway is also deployed. Uh, that's also a separate uh, Julio charm, um, and both uh, work together to uh, create the infrastructure for the whole layer stream interface uh, for the remote desktops uh, to connect to. Um, and when you log in into the layer stream environment, you are uh, you log in into the system um, uh, where you can uh, for in, for here you need to add a center. So um, uh, layer stream works with different kind of environments. Uh, we choose in this case, uh, of course, for OpenSec. Um, and we connect it to our Fairbanks sandbox environment. We give in uh, where the API is for the keystone, given uh, all the configurations like the domain, the project, the username, the password, um, and how uh, often it needs to refresh the information it sees, it can get from the, uh, uh, from the OpenStack project. If you have configured the center, then you uh, can configure the gateway. Um, in this case, uh, the gateway uh, was uh, installed in a CentOS uh, uh, environment. Um, you just give in what its remote IP need, uh, is, 
is configured to, what its internal IP is, so it can connect to the broker, because the broker is the part where all the data is stored. So the user accounts, it stores where the LDAP configuration is if you know, uh, connect it to your LDAP or AD uh, environment. Um, so that's where all the data is. You can just remove the gateway and install a new one or install multiple gateways to have a load balanced environment. So if we're now going to look in the configuration of the desktops, I created a special uh, configuration, Ubuntu Bionic desktops. And if we look at this configuration, um, we, you can select on uh, what the name is going to be, on, where, on which center it needs to be installed. Um, uh, you can have a lot of different configuration uh, attributes uh, changed here. Uh, you can say how much uh, desktops need to be running at the same time, uh, or at least started. Um, you can configure uh, how much it needs to start in the beginning, how, uh, when it needs to stop configuring, um, which center it needs to be, uh, what name uh, the instances are uh, going to be within the OpenSec environment. Um, and the biggest thing here is you can choose which uh, uh, which image you want. So uh, I prepared a uh, Ubuntu desktop image. In my case, I just installed it within a KVM on my own laptop, um, installed all the components needed for that, and then I uh, uploaded that image into the OpenStack environment uh, so that the, the image is in glance. Once I did that, after that you can change the image, update that image, create a snapshot of that image, and then you can uh, change uh, which version uh, of the image you want to deploy for your customers. So if you have a new updated version uh, with all the security patches installed and also the, the new developer tools or whatever you want, you can just change it here and say, okay, now remove all the desktops that are already there and then you, all your users are having the new uh, uh, updated instances available. So I have here a 4.0 which was my previous one. I updated some, uh, uh, some packages and I selected the 4.1. You can create special flavors. In this case, there is an, a layer stream flavor. Uh, uh, if you want for, uh, uh, for your uh, graphical de designers, you can create a flavor which has access to, uh, to a GPU, which is in your OpenStack environment, so that they have graphical uh, power to, to work on. You configure the network, uh, on which network uh, it need, needs to be. You can select your security groups you created. In this case, we have a, a desktop and an SSH uh, configuration created. Uh, the desktop uh, has the uh, RDP uh, uh, ports open, the SSH, of course, the SSH ports. And when all this is uh, configured, uh, you need to create a protocol plan and uh, we have several protocol plans over here. Um, we have an HTML5 uh, part, which is very nice to have, because uh, this way you can log in from anywhere in the world, uh, even in an internet cafe, and log in into your uh, system uh, without having to need any special tool. Uh, but if you are on your phone or your tablet, or you have your own uh, laptop, and you want to use an RDP connection, you can just uh, have an RDP connection, connect to it, open your desktop, and work on that. Um, Layer Stream has a, a few options for power plants, so if you don't have that much resources available on, on your hypervisor, you can tell Layer Stream, okay, when somebody logs out, please shut down or power off that system and keep it off until that user wants to log in again. So you can. Uh, so when the user logs in, it will send a signal to the desktop, it will start the desktop again, and it will uh, be available for the user to log into. And the same goes for release plans, like for instance, if you want to have something in a uh, uh, internet access in a library, so where everybody can log in, um, you can create a plan that when somebody has used that system, it logs out, it will remove that desktop or it refer to a previous snapshot so that every user information you had is gone, uh, the internet history is gone, and, and people can work on it again with a clear uh, state of desktop. Okay. 
So um, when uh, when we want to log in, uh, this is the the HTML5 uh, part. I just uh, log in into the system. I click connect on the des desktop. It's going to connect. The layer stream uses the guacamole uh, uh, environment. And I have here my desktop with several developer tools, Android Studio, PowerShell, Visual Studio Code, PyCharm. Um, and what also is nice, if somebody wants to watch a video uh, or uh, they want to even have a conference call because it also supports audio input, you can just start and have sound working within your, uh, within your remote desktop. And if we want to show you the connection through an RDP session, we will just, somebody gets an RDP file and that works on phones, on desktops or tablets. And you will have a remote desktop connection available. And uh, the remote desktop connection is uh, available um, this one, first one went through a floating IP, so it has a public IP address, uh, but it's also possible that that connection goes through the layer stream gateway. So you just need to have one public IP address where the gateway is on, and it will uh, connect through that gateway uh, without the need of any floating IP. So all, all the connections are inside of your tenant and nothing goes outside. So no direct connections. Your, if there is some strange port open on your desktop, you can, uh, nobody can access that. Um, so, uh, and I will also show you an SSH session. So you can create servers, for instance, if you want, where somebody can connect to, and then they can just connect They can connect with an SSH session within your browser. It's relatively safe because you connect first into your system as the user which has access to, your, to the desktop or to that system, and then you also need to log in again uh, through the SSH session, of course. So yeah, this is a very nice way to uh, make sure that all the developers have the, the, the right tools, uh, always updated, um, and being able to uh, uh, to have the correct tools and speed up. So if you have a new a new colleague, you say, here's your desktop, you can start right away in, instead of having him to install his laptop all over again and installing the tools they need, you have everything available for you. And all those desktops you can see here running are uh, within the uh, layer stream uh, project. So that's... Uh, uh, it's a bit the case of the, the layer stream uh, environment. Um, I don't know if you want to show want something. To, uh, I want to wrap it up um, because uh, I think our time is gone. I think we could uh, have spent some more time in chatting about it, but uh, our time is limited, of course. Uh, so if you have further questions, uh, we are available here. We, are, uh, we have our boot on the marketplace, so it's uh, boot 8, A29. So please come there because I see that the, the newcomers are coming in. So uh, I really thank you for your attention that you was coming here. And uh, yeah, please feel, feel free if you have questions, we are here or on the booth. And uh, I would say have a safe travel home when you are going today or tomorrow you are going home. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, see you soon, hopefully.